new show on Fox 2. This is called The 101 on Sports. I'm Randy Carricker from 101 ESPN, and I'm excited to be hosting a program that will feature big-name guests, a look at the St. Louis sports scene, and interviews that you won't find anywhere else. Coming up on our first edition of the show, we're talking Cardinal baseball, as Michael Gersh, the general manager of the club, will join us from Jupiter. The soccer world is getting a taste of what that sport means to the city of St. Louis, and St. Louis City SC is off to a record-setting start in a brand new stadium. Their sporting director, Lutz Fahnenstiel, will check in. But first, it's a look at the Cardinals as they open up the season this week. Before we look at 2023, let's take a look back at 2022. The Redbirds made another trip to postseason play as they dominated at home and went 53 and 28 at Bush Stadium and finished with a record of 93 and 69. The Central Division of the National League was formed in the mid 90s and the Cardinals remarkably have won the division 12 times. This time it came under first year manager Ali Marmo. So what's in store for 2023? Let's bring in the Cardinals analyst Brad Thompson. BT, always good to see you. Randy, great to see you. Thanks for having me. Well, let's start with this. You were down in spring training for most of the duration, and most of the regulars weren't there for a couple of weeks because of the World Baseball Classic. We really did get a fortunate and unusual opportunity to see a lot of kids, didn't we? Randy, it's crazy because it, it, out of all the guys that were missing, and as you know, the Cardinals sent more players to the World Baseball Classic than anybody else in all of baseball the Cardinals team looks very good without the guys that were there. Now, that's not me saying that we should be without those guys, but it just tells you the depth of the organization. And certainly when you're talking about that, the first two names that come to mind are Jordan Walker, who we have talked a ton about that said, hey, look, he might have a chance to hit his way on the team. Randy, that's all he has done is taken advantage of the opportunity to hit his way onto the team. He's done it with power. He's shown off his speed. He's shown off his athleticism. The glove in the outfield looks good. The first game we had a chance to do on Valley Sports, uh, uh, he hit a home run. He legged out an infield single, and then he made like a jumping grab up against the wall. He checked every single box in the first game, and then he just kept doing that. So he's been electric. And then the other one that you look at who got a ton of time with Tommy Edmond being off at the World Baseball Classic and Paul DeYoung being hampered by injuries throughout is Mason Wynn. And this kid is freaking electric. I mean, if you're looking for one guy in the field just to keep an eye on all game because you never know what he's going to do, that's Mason Wynn, another guy that has just hit himself into relevancy. Now, I don't believe that that's a situation where he hits his way onto this ball club. He's a young player. He's got to play every single day. But I think that he probably streamlined what his line looks like to Major League Baseball because he has impressed everybody. We saw how good Michaelis and Wainwright were in the, the, the classic. Uh, Jack Flaherty has been healthy. I think that's all we need to see. Steven Matz has been as good as you could expect. And I have faith in Jordan Montgomery. If you're going to win because of starting pitching, which I still think you do, I like what the Cardinals have, not only in their first five, but beyond their starting five. Yeah, Randy, I do too. And, and as you know, you talk about it on the radio every day. I've been talking about it. And like that was the big question mark is what is that going to look like? You mentioned two of the key names in Flaherty and Steven Matz combined. They didn't throw 80 innings last year. So like you really need to get something out of those guys. They both look very good in spring training. Steven Matz might look the best in spring training. His ability to throw his fastball to both sides of the plate. He's been getting that swing and miss something that we all know the Cardinals rotation could use more of. We know that Jack Flaherty has that also. Uh, so I feel very comfortable with these guys, especially through 162 game season with the five that you have with the depth that you mentioned, Randy, uh, there's going to be a lot of disappointed players at, at uh, the beginning of the season. Some guys that want to be on the, the big league roster that aren't, that probably deserve to be on the roster on other teams, but that's a, a good thing with all the depths the car, the Cardinals have. The question to me when I look at the rotation still remains at the end of the season, who's the guy? Like, who's the guy that you're going? It's game one of the postseason, and there is a fear factor there. Because I still truly do believe that if you're going to win a championship, you have to have an ace, probably two of them, that somebody else fears. And I hope we see those guys emerge throughout the season for the Cardinals. Who has a chance? Obviously, Flaherty's one of those guys. Yeah. Who, who if Flaherty is what we hope he can be, who would be your number two guy potentially? Well, I, I still think number two right now would be Michaelis, even though he, he's not going to emerge into that dominant guy. But what Michaelis does is a very good skill set. He knows how to pitch. I am really interested to see how Dusty Blake, the new Cardinals pitching coach, 
gets the most out of everybody, how he better deploys maybe these guys arsenal than they did a year ago. That's something he's been the pitching strategist for a couple of years now. I think that some of the, the concepts and ideas that he had for some guys were oftentimes left on the cutting room floor. Well, now he's got more of a voice. The guys are absolutely bought into it. So I, I believe that those two, if you're looking, that's a very good one, two punch for you. But what I just talked about, Stephen Matz, his strikeout ability. I know that there's a, a lot more there and Jordan Montgomery and while you know look Wainwright doesn't profile as the punch out the world we know what he can do also so uh, I feel like if I had to pick my guys like one two in a series right now likely Flaherty Michaelis depending on who you're playing if you needed a lefty but uh, I'm really encouraged with what I've seen and I'm very interest, uh, interested to see what the long-term future looks like with, with the uncertainty around the rotation in the future. BT one more thing you spent a lot of time around Ali Marmol last year. I, I spent a little time. I didn't think he really needed to change anything. During this spring, was he the same as he's always been? Yeah, he, he really had. He's very constant. He's very present in what he's doing. And he's got a great idea of just his guys and what they're going through. Uh, I, I really enjoyed talking to him early in spring about all of the rule changes. That's what everybody wanted to talk about. And he said, look, I, I'm not going to say the rule changes are, are, aren't important. They're incredibly important. But our focus at the beginning of camp, as soon as we have our, our full team here is, we're going to work on all the things that make us successful now. Hey, appreciate your time as always. And we'll do this again as the season unfolds. Thanks, BT. R Randy, anytime, my man. I love hanging out with you. Coming up from Jupiter, Florida, it's the general manager of the Cardinals, Michael Gersh, on the 101 on Sports here on Fox 2. get ready to open up their 2023 campaign on Thursday. We head down to Jupiter to visit with the general manager of the St. Louis Cardinals, Michael Gersh. Gersh, as everybody knows you, good to see you. How's everything going in Florida? Uh, everything's great down here. Good to be here. And, and what, a, what a good spring. I want to start, though, with the guys that played in the Winter uh, World Baseball Classic. How were you satisfied with the way that the players had a chance to prepare uh, around the world? Um, I mean, I think Look, I think our players did a good job of, of prepping on their own. I mean, it was certainly a process where if you showed up on the first day of spring training, having not done anything to try getting ready to play competitive games two weeks later, you're going to, you're going to be in trouble. But, um, I think all the players knew what they needed to do. They, they, a lot of guys were down here well before report date and, uh, and everyone had, had what they needed. And Gersh, we look at especially Goldie and Arenado, and they look like Goldie and Arenado. Uh, you're in the business of projecting what players will do in the future at certain ages. Is it fair for us as fans to expect those two to do in 2023 what they did in 2022? <laughs> um, I mean, I think anytime you got two guys who finished the top three MVP <laughs> voting, expecting them to repeat that is a pretty a pretty darn high high bar for them to, to, to hurdle over. I, 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 there's no reason to expect them to, to do anything but be excellent players. Now, whether that translates into a first and third MVP finish or whether that translates into something slightly different, uh, you know, is it, the whims of baseball, but I don't think there's any reason to be, uh, anything but optimistic that we have the best first and third combination in baseball. No doubt. And we saw that in the winter baseball or the world baseball classic. And the other thing about those two is that they're especially Goldie, just numbingly consistent. So I, I that's why I feel like as, as a fan, I say, okay, well, this is what he's done during his career. I feel like I can ex keep expecting that. No, I think that's right. And, and part of the reason they're so consistent is because their preparation is, is amazing. They, they both, uh, they, they both take this, super seriously but also love baseball in a way that means that they can spend hours prepping and 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 working and studying film and studying themselves and preparing to be to be you know at their best at all times and it's, it's really impressive to watch it's great the way it rubs off on our other younger players Gersh, i want to ask you about your first spring with wilson Contreras because it's different when you see a guy on the other side 18 times a year as opposed to seeing him in your clubhouse and on your field uh, every day in spring training. What have your impressions been of Contreras? I, I think the biggest thing is, is his commitment to, to 
like stepping into Yadi's shoes and being a, a big part of our team. I mean, you know, Wilson was a big, you know, he could have been playing the WBC with Venezuela. Um, and, and I'm sure there are some people who wish he had, but if he, he wanted to be here. He wanted to, the moment we signed him, he wanted video and scouting reports and data on all of our pitchers. He wanted to prepare. He wanted to get to know these guys and he wanted to show that he cared about, about making our pitching staff as good as it can be. And so I think, you know, the, the, the on field stuff, how he plays, the athleticism, the strong arm, the way he just loves to throw the ball all over the diamond, any opportunity he's got is going to back pick. Um, we all have seen that as a player, but, but sort of the behind the scenes, the time and, and, and passion he has for, for understanding the role of a catcher and, and how that fits into what our pitching staff is trying to do has been really impressive. And you mentioned his athleticism. You've been around since 2006. And I look at Jordan Walker. I look at, and these are guys that will likely be here on opening day. You've got Walker, you've got O'Neill, you've got Contreras, you've got Edmund, uh, you've got some Lars Newtbar. I think this is the most athletic Cardinal team probably since you've been here. Um, I think that's probably right. I mean, I think, I think you know, last year was similar. You know, we could, you know, move some guys in and out. You know, Bader was a heck of an athlete. And so, uh, but yeah, we, we have we have a team full of, of guys who, who I think it'll help us adjust some of the rule changes that, that promote balls in play, promote stolen bases, promote, you know, more range defensively. I think all, a lot of that stuff will work out well for us just because of the type of players that we have. That's why I asked the question is about the rules changes. How do you think the Cardinals will be most affected either positively or negatively by the rules changes? Um, I don't think there's anything in particular that will affect us any more than other teams. Really? I think there's, a lot of small things um, around the running game, the, the slightly bigger bases, the uh, the step off, the limitations. Sometimes you can you can disengage with the rubber will make that sort of an interesting thing to try to try to strategize. I mean, if the if the base runner knows that the pitcher knows that the base runner knows that the pitcher knows that he can only step off one more time, then does he does he not step off or does he take a bigger lead and then he gets picked off and you know, it, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Gersh, last year you spent a good portion of the season looking for productive left-handed hitting. Now you've got Newbar coming into the season. You've got an improved, apparently, Nolan Gorman. You've got Donovan, who had a 394 on base. How do you feel specifically about those three young lefty hitters as we traverse the spring? You know, I, I think that, that them all stepping up and all having, you know, Donnie and Gorman having great springs here and Newt, you know, taking the uh, all of Asia by storm. <laughs> Uh, have been a positive. I mean, we talked a little bit going into the offseason about potentially adding a left-handed, you know, middle of the order, sort of someone to sort of help Gorman, I mean, help uh, Goldie and Arenado out. And I think what we've seen is that Gorman's made big strides. Donovan's added some power. Newbar's doing his thing. Even Burleson has hit the ball really hard down here. Not with a ton of luck, but, but it has shown, has shown that, uh, you know, he's, he's got what it takes to, to, to contribute at some point this year. So th- there's, there's been a lot of good positive developments on the left-hand hitting part, which is great because we we uh, we kind of bet on that happening. I want to ask you finally about your starting pitching because we've all assumed throughout the offseason that it's going to be Wainwright, Flaherty, Michaelis, Montgomery, Matts, and those five have given us no reason to believe anything else. But beyond those five, if you were to guess a six, a seven, and then where does Graceffo fit in? What has he shown you? Could he be in the majors as soon as this year? So I think one of the things that's hard to talk about in terms of like a sixth, seventh, eighth starting pitcher is that, is that it depends on when it happens and it depends on how long we know it's going to, like if an injury happens and a guy's got to start tomorrow, the honest answer is whoever was lined up to start for Memphis tomorrow is probably going to come up and take the start, right? Whereas if there's an injury where we have five days to reset our minor league roster, our minor league rotation or pull a guy out short from a start. So he's out, he's rested. The numbering of six, seven, and eight is less important than the sort of the, the logistics of when actually we need an extra starter or when the double header pops up or when whatever it is that, that makes that an issue. So, um, I think the good thing is that, you know, uh, you know, Woody has pitched great and, and, and Jake will be, you know, have a role somewhere. Libertor has pitched well. Libertor has improved some of his, uh, the attributes of his fastball, which is great. Um, Graceffo has looked good. Uh, Connor Thomas has looked good. Um, so we've got, we've got options. Uh, Dakota Hudson is still trying to kind of, kind of find it, but, but, um, obviously has a long history of, of, uh, being a big league, quality big league starting pitcher. So we have a lot of options. Finally, last thing about the youth, because you spent so much time in player development and to see all these young pitchers and players that are either here or on the way, that really has to be heartening for you. 
No, this spring has been really fun from a from a front office standpoint. With all the guys gone for the WBC, there have just been a ton of at-bats and innings for, for young players, and almost all of them have performed. Almost all of them have shown well. It's been a lot of fun to, to see that. It's, I know when uh, fans come and, and the lineup has a bunch of names they don't recognize, it might not be ideal, but but it's, it's great for these kids to have the opportunity, and it's great that they've all taken it and run with it. Gersh, always appreciate your time. Looking forward to seeing you when the club gets back home and plays here in St. Louis. Have a great 2023. I appreciate it. Thanks, Randy. To the 101 on Sports on Fox 2. I'm Randy Carricker, and we are at the Washington University Orthopedics Training Center, the home of St. Louis City SC, and we're with the sporting director for SC, Lutz Fon and Steel. Thanks for taking some time with us. First of all, Lutz, this is a beautiful facility. Compared to other facilities you've been around, how does this one rank? Yeah, I think it's uh, absolutely brilliant, uh, even, even world class. I mean, it's, you know, we put a lot of effort in, in planning it. Uh, in building it, having it right next to the stadium, of course, uh, that's the cherry on the top. But I think we have a, a facility which gives the best possible ways to prepare a team, to have an academy and the first team together. So when it comes to infrastructure, I think we're very, really high up the food chain. You talk about effort and time in building something. You've spent a lot of time and effort in, in building this team off to a very good start. How does this compare, the start, to what you expected? Well, I mean, uh, am I really super surprised? Uh, no, I'm not. But I think it's all about uh, our philosophy. You know, I mean, you can win games, you can lose games. That's uh, pretty normal. Uh, interesting in the States is that an expansion team is not really getting taken that serious. Uh, you somehow must finish last, otherwise it's not a normal expansion team. Uh, I think that was for us a big opportunity because we were never the typical expansion team because we had our players together, uh, a big group for more than six months. We had Bradley installed uh, as the head coach a year before. So we had a, a lot of time to prepare. Uh, we had an MLS Next Pro as a kind of... Uh, yeah, it was a blueprint. It was a big opportunity for us to really try out things, to, to figure out how do we sleep in Seattle, how do we travel to Portland, where do we eat in Vancouver. Mm -hmm. So to get to know that Western Conference already more on a, on a traveling side uh, was a big advantage. And uh, I think that's all little reasons why the start was uh, pretty promising. And Lutz, on the day you got hired, you talked about the system that you wanted to, to implement, that it would be a, a St. Louis-centric system, something that the, the fans here would appreciate. And it looks to me, first of all, you did get the perfect coach for the system, didn't you, and Bradley, but it looks to me like what you do as a team is kind of a shock to the system of, of other teams, the aggressiveness with which you play. Yeah, we knew them from day one. I don't think there is any big surprise as the way we play. So we said we want to press and counter press. We want to be high intense. We want to uh, work hard and we want to be a unit. And I think uh, the, 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 the team character, the way we perform as a team uh, is definitely something special. That not always means that you win every game. That doesn't mean that you always get the perfect results. But if you leave 100, 110% out every weekend, I think uh, the fans appreciate that. You know, I think that's the approach you need to have in St. Louis. That's the approach you need to have in the Midwest. And I think we really created that style. I mean, I grew up in that style in Hoffenheim where we were very successful with it, but I really believe it fits perfectly to that region in the United States. And yes, other teams have uh, problems to, to keep up with our ways. Uh, they don't know us yet. I think they will get prepared better and better. But uh, definitely it's something uh, what we want to do in the future as well. We don't want to adjust it and change that. For now, I think that is a plan we want to stick to. And as you said, I came here in the middle of 2020 and everything was planned. Every single step was planned. And so far we followed that step through. And looking at the academy, the next pro team as well as uh, now the pro team, I think uh, you can see a certain handwriting and the results so far are also pretty good. And you've had multiple players that have told us, hey, we wanted to come to St. Louis. Obviously, you did a great sales job, but what do you think the main reason is the guys wanted to play here and across the street at City Park? I mean, to have uh, probably one of the best uh, soccer stadiums in the country, maybe the best, uh, 
definitely at the moment the best facility uh, in the country that will probably change again because new facilities will be built that's like a, a normal circle of life uh, but I think the, the soccer culture you know everybody who, who digs deep and today we have our best friend called Google uh, where even if you are in Brazil or in Germany or whatever you can figure out that St. Louis is a special place when it comes to soccer so uh, all the players, all the agents did the research and then of course talking to the players, explaining what we want to do, being part of something completely new. I mean the best example is Roman Berkey, mm -hmm. you know, he played at top level in the Bundesliga, he had offers from all over the world, from top European teams, but he thought that this is a very special project, uh, be part of something completely new, be part of uh, creating history with a club like St. Louis, uh, uh, that was what many players uh, got attracted to. Uh, obviously, I knew most of the players personally before. Mm -hmm. uh, I tried to sign some. I signed some before, like Klaus, who I signed as a 17-year-old in Hoffenheim. And, uh, and all that kind of made things really, uh, I would say, things come very well together. We had a, a good expansion draft. We had a very interesting and good uh, super draft. So everything so far we did, we didn't really have to that much convincing people. It was more about, hey, that's what we want to do. That's what we really believe in. That's the guys who already have signed. We want to be part of that. I think we have a good match. And, yeah, and most of the people we try to sign, you know, we just didn't contact them randomly. Uh, we contacted them because I knew they will fit the system, they will fit the style. And uh, yeah, they, they, uh, most of them are happy to be here now. And you mentioned Klaus. He seems to be the essence of what you're looking for, right? He's, he's just a relentless player. Yeah, yeah, I mean, he's hardworking, as I said. I took him and he was 17, 18 from Brazil to Hoffenheim, where we played a very, very similar style. Uh, he didn't know that when he came, so it took him some time to really get adjusted to that. I loaned him out to, to Austria, where he was really successful, where he scored lots of goals in exactly the same system we play. So when, uh, when he was available for us to transfer him here, you know, and I spoke to my former club, uh, we, we found a way to bring him. And yeah, people in, in the States, people in the MLS, they didn't know him. Uh, they, they, don't, they still don't know really what to do with him. But he has that character of being really hardworking. Uh, he gives people trouble all the time. I know he's always in the defender's face and he's a good finisher as well. So he's not just the guy in the box who can score. He's also who creates lots of space and lots of work rate to help his teammates. I want to ask you one more thing because before you played your home opener against Charlotte, I asked if you could envision the way that you're, you would feel, what your emotions would be like. What was it like on that night for the home opener against Charlotte for you? Yeah, definitely a certain relief because, you know, I'm nearly worked here now for three years, which is a long time. I would call it dry. You know, we didn't have any games as the pro team. Uh, yeah, the academy, we had great success. The next pro, we, we won the Western Conference, which was great. But to have that first ever game in the stadium and be finally part of the big MLS uh, was something special. So it was a mix between being excited, uh, not nervous, really excited, and then of course being relieved that finally we made it to that day. We had a nice taste already in Austin at the away game, how it will be, but then being here with the lights, with the people, with I would call it unconditional support uh, from the stands, uh, definitely a special moment. And you know, the fans actually topped it in the second game. It was freezing cold out there, mm -hmm. and I thought there were a few guys will stay at home and watch it on Apple TV and just uh, you know like 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 not coming to the stadium. Mm -hmm. But it was full, they enjoyed the game, they enjoyed the victory, and most important, they stayed till 10 minutes after the game, till we walked around and actually said thank you for everybody. Uh, I, I like that, uh, I think that's something, a routine we would like to keep up. And so far, every home game was, uh, you know, just absolutely brilliant. Congratulations on the great start. Good luck the rest of the way, and I'm sure that we'll be talking a lot. Thanks so much. Thanks, Lutz. That is Lutz Fadensteel. He is the director of sport here at St. Louis City SC. Also, our thanks to Brad Thompson and Mike Gersh for joining us. And thanks to you for tuning in for The 101 on Sports. We'll see you next week here on Fox 2.